Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session um, on digital content delivery using your LMS assessment tool. So my name is Bailey Dobbs. I'm an instructional designer at the University of Oregon. With me today are three of my colleagues. Karen Matson is an instructional technologist and designer at the U of O. Eric Ford is an instructor of operations and business analytics in UO's Lundquist College of Business. And Mike Price is a senior instructor in mathematics in our College of Arts and Sciences. In just a minute, they're gonna share their experiences with you using this, this method in their online courses that we're gonna talk about. But first, I just wanna briefly contextualize this a bit before I turn it over to them. So well, we're all here because we have the same goal. We wanna help students achieve success and maintain motivation in our online courses, especially when it comes to engaging with the content. And we all know this would be challenging for many students, especially those who've not mastered those self-regulation skills that can be so key in online course success. Students sometimes need more structural support in order to self-regulate their learning. So, you know, scaffolding is that buzzword that everyone's using. So um, today we're gonna talk about a structural change that you can make to your online course that's been effective at our university. And we'll give you two examples from two different disciplines. Um, now, uh, we know that everybody here will have access to different learning management systems, depending on your university, different educational technology. So we're gonna try and keep the terms generic. However, um, when talking about just our direct experiences, we'll obviously refer to the tools that we use. So at the UO, we use the Canvas LMS and we have integrations with Zoom and then Panopto. Panopto is our video um, recording and hosting platform, similar to other products you guys might have like Kaltura or VidGrid. Um, so it's got features like being able to add, you know, limited format quiz questions throughout a video. So it's really good. You might hear reference to um, iClicker, which is our classroom response system. Um, but no matter what brand of tool you're using, you should be able to achieve a similar setup with most uh, LMSs and most video CMSs. Um, but in terms of digital pedagogy, you know, when you're considering which of these tools you plan to use, you want to consider the impact of that digital tool on the learning. So it's as much about using your tools thoughtfully as it is about when not to use those tools. So as we talk about the use of the LMS quiz tool today, keep it, keep, just keep that in mind because this may not be a model that's right for every course, but it may work for you. So this format we're talking about, using the LMS quiz tool to actually deliver your content it's a structural change from what you might consider typical or traditional content delivery, where you might embed a video on a page, then make a list of readings they need to complete, give an assignment or an activity, like tell them to watch this video and go complete this quiz or read this article and go do this assignment. Um, here, with this method, you're doing all of that within the quiz tool, creating a very structured learning pathway that incorporates active learning, and it allows for scaffolding. So in this way, we're changing the sequence of how students access, engage with, and synthesize the content um, by wrapping that up with a formative assessment component. So I, I hope you find it helpful. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Eric so he can show you how it's done. Um, thanks, Bailey. Uh, that was a really nice introduction. Um, so my name is Eric Ford. Um, and uh, as Bailey said, I, um, I teach at the University of Oregon in the Lundquist College of Business. I teach large enrollment courses. I, I teach um, a spreadsheet analysis course. And then I also teach a very classic uh, introduction to business course, BA 101. And I have uh, online versions of each of those courses. And that's really what we'll focus on today is, um, is the mechanisms that I've come up for delivering content in those large enrollment asynchronous online courses. And uh, really the, the theme of what I'm gonna talk about today um, can be distilled down to uh, the folly of assigning optional work to students. And, and, that, and I, wanna, I wanna broaden our definition of optional work uh, to, the, to the one that students were probably working with. And that is that uh, an assignment is optional if it's not tied to some kind of assessment that has some kind of grade in the course for them. And you know, um, I'll, I'll give you um, an example of that from my own experience of being a student not too long ago. You know, I had, I had two classes that were structured very similarly. And in one, I, we would need to read a, case, you know, like a 10 page case study uh, before we came into class so we could discuss it in class. And we would show up and the instructor would become very frustrated with the fact that no one really seems to have read it and, and understands the material and can talk about it. 
And then in another class, it was very similar. We had, a, we, had, we had a similar reading we needed to do, but the instructor would have us email or submit a summary of the case before we came into class. And in that class, class um, there was enough people that had a really good understanding or at least a skim value of it that we could have discussions and the instructor didn't become frustrated by it. And you know, so the question that I would pose to you right now, you know, is, um, is really, you know, which, uh, which instructor um, or, you know, or is that, is that the student's fault or is it the instructor's fault, you know, um, you know for the, the students just, you know, behaving as students do or, or the instructor not, not understanding that and building stuff in there. Uh, for me, I, I believe it's part of my job to, um, to build the structure um, that is going to help students help themselves. And, and so I, I really try and keep that um, in mind. And uh, so a couple more questions just to, to start this thing off. And we don't have them build us questions. So maybe just uh, you could put it in the chat if you think that'd be fun. But you know, what percentage of your students do you think are engaging with your videos? If you've got videos in online courses, video lectures, uh, video demonstrations, you know, what percentage of your students do you really think are engaging with those and watching those? Um, and then a, a follow-up question could be, you know, what percent of your students do you think engage in optional work? And, I, and I'll take a look at the chat and see if anybody's um, if anybody's over there in that. And somebody says, yeah, low percent for videos, 20% videos, 5% optional work. Okay, yeah. So I thought I was gonna have to disagree, but I agree with the 20%, you know, 50 know, really low stuff. Yeah, always smaller than what you think, not as many as I'd like. Okay, so I think I think we're all pretty much on the same page then. Yeah, I, I feel like students don't do. Um, optional work. And so, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you a couple iterations of, of online courses that, um, that I developed that I think address this really well. And so I'm going to share my screen and, uh, and walk you through a couple of my Canvas courses. And so the very first Canvas course that I made was for the spreadsheet analysis course. And I walked into uh, my, uh, my colleague and co-presenter's office, Karen Matson. Um, right back when we transferred from Blackboard to Canvas. So we were in our first year of Canvas. And, um, and this was back, you know, um, uh, online was, was still very new to us. And I, and I walked into her office and I said, I want to make an online course. And here's what my course generally looks like. I walk into the course, I, I walk into the, the large classroom and uh, I put a PowerPoint up on the board for about 10 or 20 minutes while I explain what we're going to do for the day. And then we switch over to the software demonstration. I ask them to download a file. We build it together and the class ends. So I said, so I need to put up a lecture video. And that's what we figured out right here. We're like, okay, we can put a video onto Canvas. And that's just what that looked like, right? We said, okay, here's a Panopto video on Canvas. And we pulled that off. And then I said, okay, well, how am I actually gonna make sure that students watch that video, right? Why would they engage with that? Why wouldn't they just skip to the end of the lecture or skip my entire lecture? So we said, okay, well, let's put a quiz right after it. And so that's what this is. This is just a quiz that is asking questions about the video the students just watch. And, and that's, that's the pattern for, um, for these courses. Anytime that there is a video that students are you know, required to watch, they are then required to take a, you know, an assessment based on that video. So that you know, through this repetition, we set up the expectation that the path of least resistance for students to get through this stuff and get their grade is just to watch the video so that they can take the quiz. And so that was that system there. And then of course, you know, um, in the spreadsheet analysis class here, 20 minutes in after three lectures and three, three quizzes, we move over here where I ask students to, to download this file and they build it with me in these next four videos. Well, now the students are actually doing something, right? Um, and so I'm not worried about as asking questions then, but I do have them turn it in at the end of class right there in that file upload. If I didn't have them turn in this file at the end, I believe that a lot of students would stop right here at this quiz and would just skip the rest of class. Or they might start the first video and then just watch the last bit of this last video. But I think very few students would actually sit through the whole thing. I'm just competing with their time. They just have other things to do. And if I, if I put this into the optional bucket for them, they will skip it. So everything here that's just required for them to do. Now, this system has some real limitations. One, it's just really bulky. For every you know, five minute video, I have a link here and then I have a quiz. This makes for a really messy grade book because there's just tons of quiz columns in it. Um, and, and it takes up a lot of space on this LMS too, on this page, uh, particularly for a more classic class where there's just a lot of lecture videos. If we look up in here into like my very first class lecture where I'm just talking, this is a real monster because there's, you know, 
a dozen videos in here and a dozen quizzes, and this just takes up a lot of room. Another limitation of this is that because these are just here as, you know, as clickable stuff on this Canvas page, um, students can always access it unless I actually you know, go over and physically remove these things, hide them from view or delete them. So that's the only way that I can really control and keep a student from going and trying to finish all the week one work in week eight. Um, so there were some real limitations to this. It did work well, uh, but the, the next iteration of this course um, was a big improvement. And I'll show you that now. What I did in my rebuild of this course in this last year um, was to leverage uh, housing everything that you just saw inside of the quiz tool of Canvas. And, and so the, the big light bulb moment was when I first looked at the quiz here. This is just a single quiz. That entire series of videos we looked at, those three videos and those three quizzes all fit inside of this one assessment now, inside of this one quiz. And the real light bulb moment was um, the realization that the rich text editor in this LMS, if we come here and we do the rich text editor here, this allows me to do anything inside of an individual quiz question, instead of just asking a multiple choice question, this editor allows me to build anything that I could build anywhere else inside of this LMS. And so it, it, I you know, started saying, okay, well, let's go ahead and embed videos in here. Okay? And uh, so this video is embedded in there. And then those quiz questions that we had before, just follow the videos and more embedded videos with quiz questions, more embedded videos. And then, so the path of least resistance here is for a student just to watch the videos and answer the quiz questions. You know, this cleans up a lot of stuff. I mean, it's, it's much more compact and everything we just looked at, all three videos and all five or eight of these questions on this page produce one grade column in the grade book. It's a much cleaner system. And now, you know, this is Canvas and, and, and it works really well here, but that's not to say this couldn't be done on any LMS or even without an LMS. I could build this same exact thing, not quite as elegant, but this same thing on any web page. I mean, all I'm doing is just embedding videos and then asking questions, which I could do with just, you know, Qualtrics surveys or something like that. I could easily build this just with a blank web page and no supporting LMS. And you could as well on with whatever resources you have. So if I head on back over to the modules page, now that demonstration that we looked at where students downloaded a file, they moved through four, uh, four videos with me building that, and then they upload that file at the end, that has also become just one housed all here inside of one quiz. Using that same thing, leveraging the rich text editor, we can see that students are now doing that same thing here. You know, one of these questions is actually just a file download, right? Um, another one of these questions is actually just an embedded video and an embedded video. I went ahead and extend this one out, made it, I think, into five or six videos. And then at the end, they submit that file there. And then, um, and then of course, so this is submitted. And this also makes one grade book entry because this is just one quiz. So not only is this a lot cleaner, but we also got away from the messy thing of not having any control over when students get into this because, because I am housing this entire lecture, if you will, inside of one assessment, all of the tools that are available to assessments are now available to control my lecture. And if we head back over into at least Canvas's controls here, and I imagine your LMS has similar controls, this is really designed for me to be able to build like a midterm or some big quiz. And because of that, there are a lot of tools in here. I can now set a time limit on this. I can set a password on this. Um, I can come down here and I can, I can control availability by dates and you know, extend dates for certain students. And so all of these tools that are designed to make you know, really robust like midterm exams are now available to every lecture or demonstration that I build inside of these. And so it really has, um, it really has been a revolution in what I've been able to do with this class and that these things are so compact now that I've been able to do a lot more on this Canvas page. And uh, so, uh, so this, was, um, this was a big improvement for those reasons there. And then another iteration of this example, it's actually one that I built in the middle in between the original spreadsheet analysis class and this one that I just built last year, um, was, the, uh, was the introduction to business course, BA 101, that using this same concept, um, I, um, I, I made the, uh, the introduction to business course. Now, this is a freshman course that requires a lot more control and curation. And, and so uh, to do that, 
what I've done is, you know, in, in that course, you can see here these different kinds of assignment types. We have a digital textbook, um, we have a business simulation, and then we have our lecture, and that's how that course kind of works. And so this is an hour to an hour and a half lecture. Um, in, case, in this case, it's probably an hour and 15 minutes in my marketing segmentation lecture. This is going to be, well, so 12 to 15 minute videos, so maybe 10 videos in there. And then of course, I am going to have questions in there because if this was just, you know, was just um, lecture videos, I don't think anyone would watch them, right? And so what we see is that what this is in fact is a quiz in the uh, Canvas LMS here, right? a quiz that then has videos followed by questions, right? followed by a video, followed by questions. And so this is the instructor view here. I'll switch over to the student view so you can see it's actually quite a bit different. But you notice that these aren't actually embedded videos. Um, this is a bit of wizardry here that I figured out with uh, with Karen Matson because uh, you know this was going to be, these are Panopto lecture videos and I didn't want students watching these in small embedded boxes. And so what this is, is this is a little bit of wizardry here so that if you click on this, it actually automatically launches. Um, it automatically launches a new tab that then is in the full Panopto player so that students can get all the functionality of that, of actually having access to the slides, uh, the chat and all the, all the, everything else there. Um, but the student perspective on this one is much more controlled. If we go back into this, and instead of being in, in, in instructor mode, we go over to the preview, what we'll see is that this is a very curated path in this class. All students can do is interact with one thing at a time and click the next button. They must click on this to then start that Panopto player. And then after that, what they can do is they can go ahead and they can click on their next button there. I need to move my Panopto uh, thing out of the way. They can move the next button there and say, okay. And that takes them to one of three questions that are randomly pulled from that bank of 10 that you saw. And so students are forced to move through this in this very curated way. Um, if we go back and we look at this module, that was the marketing segmentation lecture, hour and 15 minutes, 10 videos, quiz questions in between each one. But the other elements of this course are still, they still follow the same, uh, the, the same overarching principle of tying assessments to things. Now, this e-textbook is actually, that's, uh, this is McGraw-Hill's uh, smart book. And so uh, that's an adaptive textbook where students read highlighted sections and then are forced to ask or to answer questions that are based on what they're reading and they're redirected back into the textbook from those quiz questions. No way to avoid that. They've got to answer the questions to get out of that. Um, a video uh, from the publisher, again, same thing, questions in there. Um, a training video for the Mike Spike simulation with quiz questions in, involved in there. The lecture that we looked at and then an actual participation in the business simulation where they're assessed on their performance on that website. And so there is not a single thing in this module that is not assessed, that doesn't have things tied to it that forces participation. And in fact, there is nothing in this entire course that is not coupled with an assessment so that students are forced to do that. It's just the principle for everything I build and, I, and I'll never veer away from it um, because it, it really has worked. And, um, and I, think it, I think it produces a good course that has the mechanisms that are there to help students um, do what they, what they want to do. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that is it in a nutshell. Um, I hope that I didn't move too fast and that that was entertaining. And now I will turn this over to Karen Matson um, and she can tell you a little more about this stuff. Karen, you're muted. Thank you. I thought I did the mute part first. I got to move the mouse around fast. Thank you, Eric. Um, again, hi, I'm Karen Madsen. And about four years ago, I read a post by Chris Hofer in the Canvas community regarding using the quiz tool to deliver your lesson. I shared this idea with Eric and wow, you can see what he has done with this, right? I mean, he's taken and he's run with it. So in Canvas, we can use the text question type, which is, which is essentially a no question. It is not scored. It allows us to put our lecture content in, which can be in any media format. We can follow that up with a question or two, multiple choice, true, false, essay, or any of the 10 question types that Canvas has. We can also rinse and repeat until our lesson is complete. And we saw a great example of that with what Eric has done and how that has cleaned up his course site. So now we know your LMS might be a little bit different, but essentially you just want a question option that is not graded, 
and a tool that allows you to add the media content. Most of the larger systems like Blackboard, Moodle, and B2L have this ability. But you might be thinking, hey, if you guys have a video platform, and Bailey told you that we do, we have a Panopto. And that does let you add quiz questions to the video, so why not do it that way? And the answer to that deals with the limitations of that tool. In Panopto, you can only do multiple choice, true, false, and simple fill in the blank. The Canvas quiz tool is more robust, offers more flexibility. The other part of that answer will be discussed by Mike Price in a moment, and it deals with the ability to enter formulas. So one of the benefits of building your content in the quiz tool in this way is that it provides the scaffolding that a student might need by chunking the content and then providing structured questions and guidance around the topics. These questions contribute to their learning by aiding retrieval. I'd like to share a quote from Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter C. Brown. Retrieval practice, recalling facts or concepts or events from memory as a more effective learning strategy than review by rereading. A single simple quiz after reading a text or hearing a lecture produces better learning and remembering than rereading the text or reviewing the lecture. This is why faculty use student response polling systems in the classroom. They want to engage students, ask them multiple choice, true, false questions to make sure they understood the concept that was just delivered. They can review that concept as well as needed, depending upon you know, how students did with their clickers, right? We all want the students to be engaged in the content that's being delivered rather than just being passive recipients. We know what the literature says, that more engagement, more retrieval of that information leads to better retention of the material and higher achievement of the learning outcomes. This method is just one way to accomplish this online. So Eric, as we can see, really ran with this idea, but this method has spread across our campus. In the summer of 2020, yes, that summer, we offered a one week summer intensive for faculty teaching online and those that had to go remote at the last minute. Eric and I presented this method to a group that happened to include Mike Price. He saw what Eric was doing and had that light bulb moment about what this meant he could do with his online math class. I'll let Mike tell you about his experience so you can see how another discipline has implemented this same strategy, but in a different way. So Mike. Thanks, Karen. Hi. So I am Mike Price. I am a mathematics instructor at the U of O with these other fine people. Uh, so the piece that so so because I'm in a, a STEM discipline, um, it, I always feel like it's nice to have an alternative perspective. I've I've definitely been in talks that are directed more at humanities and social sciences, and sometimes doesn't speak as much to my experience in the classroom, and I'm sure vice versa. So if you're in a STEM discipline, I want to take a couple minutes just to show you another implementation of that too. But as Karen mentioned, this, this was kind of a journey. I mean, so last summer, my experience with online education was uh, and, and teaching was, was relatively limited and, and was kind of, you know, a, a bit from the past. I mean, we were literally renting, you know, VHS tapes to, to watch the last time I took an online class. So uh, in this, this training, which was really great, we took a lot of time to talk about responsible ways to implement online courses. And one of the things that kept coming up for me was that Every, so much of what we were talking about was just responsible pedagogy in general and, and just thinking about what uh, students get the most out of. So for instance, uh, this is a little a snapshot of, our, of the tiles from our, our online course initiative last summer. And with the exception of the intro to online course design piece, really everything else could be with respect to any face-to-face -face class as well of, as well as online. So when we think about aligned design, we're talking about having a well-established set of learning objectives for a class and then tying those learning activities and assessments always back to those, those learning objectives. That's just responsible regardless of how you conduct your course. Assessing student learning, <laughs> active learning, you know, the idea of not just lecturing all the time and having students engage in the class, your teaching presence. And so this kept, even though it was within the context of online education, it, it kept bringing me back to just what, what great practices look like in general. So uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here, but let me take a, just a brief, brief moment about active learning just to say, uh, so this is a, a fairly famous uh, study, Scott Freeman uh, and, and team up in UW in 2014 did this meta-analysis and, and it was focused on STEM. So this had some pretty profound reverberations in, in my community at least. 
So they took all of these studies on active learning. So they had 225 different studies, did this meta-analysis, and basically said they created this dichotomy. Here are classes where basically everything is lecture. Here are classes where at least 10% of student time is dedicated to uh, engaging in the material. So that could be small group work in the class, that could be interaction with the instructor, that could be completing little problems, warm-ups, whatever. And 10% is a pretty low bar, but you can see that the impact of that was pretty profound. So the lecture courses on average had a 33.8% uh, failure rate. In the active learning courses, that went down to 21.8. Uh, it also showed about a, a half letter grade increase uh, between those, those different uh, approaches, those pedagogical approaches. Uh, if you want to talk about the graph at the end, that's fine. Maybe we can save that. But uh, suffice to say, just showing a shift in density toward uh, lower, lower uh, fail rates for those uh, active learning classes. So then this, this was sort of an existential issue for me, like what does active learning look like then if you don't have a class meeting time? If I'm not sitting down with students and having that structured time where everybody's sort of forced to be in the room and do stuff, um, how, does that, how does that engagement take place? Um, so uh, Eric has already shown you some really good implementations of this. I wanted to sort of switch over and at least give you a little perspective on, on what my site um, has looked like. So. Um, is that showing up? You got, you got Canvas there, some module action. Excellent. Okay. So uh, very, very similar, almost creepy, similar structure to, to Eric's. I don't have as many of the text headers, but <laughs> I swear I didn't copy him. Uh, so what we've got is, is a very similar organization with uh, lecture videos, basically, but they're really, it, it's, it's like Eric said, if, if it's uh, having the videos and, and the quizzes separate from one another is not only sort of distracting, it's also uh, gives students options that maybe you don't want to. Um, if, you, if you didn't pick up on the, the theme of control from, from, the, the, from Eric's piece, then well, I'll reiterate it now. It's, it's definitely nice to have, you know, a really firm grasp of what the student's pathway through this content is going to be. So, uh, so from the STEM side of things, as, as Karen already alluded to, one of the decisions was whether you have a video with a quiz embedded in it or a quiz with a video embedded in it. And it seems like, you know, what, six of one, half a dozen of another, but because of the limitations of our particular video hosting and, and creation software, um, Panopto really only having text-based options for those quizzes that are embedded there, um, it really was a struggle to, to put mathematics into that context. Um, there's some limit to, to what you can put on there, no pun intended, haha. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the implementation in Panopto just wasn't gonna be as robust. So, so this is an example of, of one of the, the lecture videos. Here's my, you know, my take it align design where I've got my learning objectives sort of up there transparently. Here's what I'm hoping you take away from this, tied to whatever our broader course objectives are. Um, when I'm doing the videos, and I'm sorry, Eric, mine are longer. I just couldn't get them down. I, ugh, I know. So th uh, this is, you know, trying to do one math example in, in, a, in less than about five minutes is pretty rough. But so uh, what I'm doing is annotating on a PDF. So I have a lecture guide that you might be able to see uh, has some uh, sort of pre-typed stuff. And then during the lesson, I'm, I'm writing on it, right? I'm sort of developing it the same way that I would during a, a course, and then providing a couple of those documents, the blank version, because students sometimes like to take notes. And that's a great way to engage actively if you can get them to. I know I have a sociology uh, colleague who ha does these videos and then just has them upload their notes to the, the actual um, quiz as well. So that's, that's another strategy. Um, and then the complete versions of that too. So then the questions, I'm basically hoping that they will start watching this video and maybe they don't even start watching. Maybe they just go down to the questions and start trying to answer it. Cause you know, this is the classic math uh, instructor experience is students, uh, you know, you tell them to go read the book and they do it, right? They just start at the beginning of the section and read all the way through and then they get a lot out of it. Doesn't that sound like your experience? Oh, no, no, really? Oh gosh, right. Yeah, they just go to the homework set and start trying to do stuff. And as soon as they run into trouble, they look back at the book and try to figure out if there's an example that looks exactly like that thing that they're struggling with. Okay, well, how about I sort of exploit that? How about I you know, give them the questions that are exactly the things that I want them to go look back at the video to discover? So oftentimes I'll have a little, you know, a definition based kind of question at the beginning uh, that really forces them just to go almost imitate from the video. Where is this in the video? How can I get this information? and then sort of trick them into actually watching this thing. 
Um, but you might notice this would be really hard with text, right? Like getting a limit notation to work out, even with like weird like underscore things, it would be nigh unreadable. Um, and one nice thing about Canvas is you notice it's not generating an image for this. It actually is generating something that is at least somewhat accessible to a screen reader. So this, you know, this would read F parentheses, T parentheses, as opposed to just image. And then you're putting alt text for literally every single math uh, thing that you, you generate, which is yikes. So it is great to have a math editor that goes along with this. I'll take a brief second with that. I know we don't want to dedicate too much time just to the specific LMS, but it is kind of nice to have. So we have multiple choice questions. We have some multiple fill blank questions that can come along with this. Um, and so really each of these is just kind of the most canonical thing that I, that I want them to get out of that video. What are, what, are, what are tied back to those learning objectives, the very specific things that I want to come out of this, uh, that I want a student to walk away with basically. So, um, and this actually actually really helped me as an instructor too. Having these sort of the, the simplest version of a thing I want a student to be able to answer has really forced me to think carefully about the learning objectives for the class, the kinds of things that I really want them to be able to do. Are these actually tied specifically to uh, the, the content? And then I'm basically hitting them with this very initial, like, like Karen's image there, right? These stepping stones, the scaffolding process, um, taking them from the imitation phase of learning, and then into more robust homework sets where they're really kind of engaging more deeply in the content. But the jump from just raw lecture video or, or just being in class, jumping to those more complicated homework sets was really a challenge for some students. I, I, I used to hear a lot of, I understood it when you did it in class, but I couldn't do the homework. And I don't hear that as much anymore. They, they have a little bit more of a stepping stone along, that pro, uh, along, that, along the way there. So just uh, as, a, as a brief little a glance, you know, see how the sausage is made kind of deal. Um, one thing I might notice, for instance, is that, uh, oh, look, this problem has uh, something that I want to format in, in a more mathy way. Um, so I'm going to try to figure out if I can make that look a little bit better. So our equation editor, you know, I say, OK, look, x equals 3. That really should be formatted in math. So I'm going to pop open my little equation editor, and it'll just format it in mathy version like that. If you are more excited about uh, uh, interesting uh, applications of LaTeX, which is which is what this is using behind the scenes, this is the basic editor. But I can always switch to advanced view and say, "Oh, I really want that fraction to be bigger, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a display style fraction, and and now it displays it bigger and more visibly for students." So so all the flexibility that I would have writing a document in LaTeX, I, I have in this system too. It involves more clicks, but you know it's it's got to compile it. Got to be got to be kind to uh, the the robots behind the scenes who need a minute to process this. So, so at any rate, there's you know a, a, a more STEM focused glance at what this uh, implementation strategy for uh, assessment sort of embedded uh, within that content delivery looks like. So I'll end my piece there, and I'll turn it over to Bailey to finish things out. All right. Thanks, Mike. Well, that wraps up the presentation portion of this session, um, and I hope this was really valuable for you. Uh, we'd now like to open the floor for just any questions you may have, so feel free to pop those in the chat or use the raise hand feature and we'll answer those. Um, I know we had one just a bit ago that um, for Eric um, that I'll read out real quick. Um, Eric, they were asking if um, if students want to go back after the fact and review any of your videos, do they have to retake the quiz or do you leave access to that open? Could you tell them a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, so uh, yeah, I saw that question come up twice there and it's a really good one. Um, so, uh, you know, so for, for students that have a reason, so for students that have an excused reason for missing um, uh, any of those quizzes, it's really nice to have the Canvas you know, uh, tools in there to actually be able to just uh, set a specific assignment date for those students so they can get back in, have the full experience, get the full points. But then I always place all of the videos and files and anything else that students might have missed into, um, you know, a page location that's just open throughout the entire course for review for students to go back into on their own. Um, and I link to that when we when we get to like exams and I say, you know, you know, if you're going to study for this exam, you may want to go back and review that and go back to our review page. So I provide that, but those none of those are the quizzes, so they can't get any of the um, they can't get any of the points for participating in that because I want students to 
come and participate in the lecture videos in the time that, you know, that I have set out so that it's much more like a face-to-face uh, -face class where we're showing up and, and getting, you know, the content uh, for, for within maybe a 48 hour window. So we're all kind of moving through the course at the same time. And uh, Mike also mentioned in the chat that he does a little bit different. He lets, he keeps the videos available until the next exam so they can use those as the study tools. Do we have other questions? Here we go, Eric, are your quizzes all timed? Um, no, none of my quizzes are timed. Um, the, the, the only things that I've put times onto um, are uh, the take home exams that I'm using right now, just because we're, um, we've, you know, we're all remote right now. Um, but normally, um, normally, no, I don't have anything. Um, I don't have any kind of time uh, limits on those because really everything that I showed you today was, um, was a, you know, a asynchronous online reproduction of a classroom experience and nothing, nothing in there is timed, you know, other than that, you know, that, um, other than that, you know, I only have so much time in class, but I'm not, uh, I'm not timing anything. Um, you know, one thing that Mike kind of hit on, uh, you know, one, one place that we used to have time was with the iClicker response system in the lecture class. I'd, you know, I'd say, I'd say, you know, here's your multiple choice question on the board. And, you know, 80% of the class would have their answer really quickly, but then I'd kind of be pushing other people like, come on, let's get this turned in. We got to, you know, we got to get on to the next, next part of the lecture. And fortunately, we don't have to do that anymore with the online Canvas quiz tools because everybody can kind of do those at their own pace. Thanks. Uh, Mike, do you have anything to add about that or? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm the same way. The, the, the quizzes that are associated with the actual the, um, content, like the, you know, the initial phase of, of acquisition of, of understanding, those are, those are not timed, but I do have other, other more, more summative assessment oriented things that are, that are timed. Um, I wanted to, to mention, I, I responded to, to uh, Marie as well, but uh, I think it sort of depends on whether, you, how you think about formative versus summative assessment, I would say. So if, you, if the delineation is whether it's worth points or contributes to the grade, that sort of ties back to Eric's thing, right? If it's not worth points, then it is optional by his definition, which, which I think I agree with. So they are worth points, but they are engineered to get students toward 100%. So it's worth something. They have some incentive to get it right, but they have multiple attempts, for instance, for my quizzes many of them are multiple choice questions. So the goal is to get a student to answering those correctly, not to sort of punitively, you know, take off because they don't know it yet. So that, that, that's sort of my distinction in, in formative assessment. Versus it's a really interesting point too, Mike, that, um, that um, I can make, if I make something worth 1% of the grade, all the students will engage with that. If I make something worth 10% um, extra credit, I'll get far fewer students that work on it. But if I make it worth you know, one one hundredth of a percent of the grade, most students will still do it. They're really not, they're really not concerned with the, with the weight of these things. It's just that it is, is it optional or is it required? And, you know, and so, um, yeah, so a lot of the, you know, there's, there's just, obviously there's tons of quizzes and assessments in this entire course, but a lot of it is weighted so low um, that it's really, you know, it's really participatory. And, um, and so the, the, the amounts don't seem to change the behavior much. It's just that they're tied to something that has a grade. We had another question about um, if you allow the students only one opportunity to answer the question. So I guess if, if they can retake these quizzes or... Um, I, I, generally, I generally don't. My philosophy is that um, if I... If I allow if I allow retakes with feedback, I'm pushing toward optional because then the path of least resistance for a lot of students maybe just to throw the question to get the feedback to get the right answer. And so I generally I generally don't. Um, if a student emails me with you know hey um, I you know I, I missed that question because no problem I just go back and I just allow it again. Um, but as just a general rule, I try to make it so that um, so that students need to need to work on that first attempt. So we have another question along those lines. How would you set this up um, with maybe multiple attempts? Do you, Mike, do you only do single attempts on yours? No, I do multiple attempts too. Sorry, I'm, I'm answering in chat a little bit because I'm not sure how my internet <laughs> connection is doing, but um, yeah, so that it's just a feature of Canvas, right? If you set up a, a quiz this way, then you can select the how many attempts that 
uh, a student can take and, and whether it, you know, it's the highest attempt or whatever that, that actually gets it's recorded very but that's that's based on the the LR. do we have any more questions um, uh, i loved i love seeing what's going on in the chat um some of you guys <laughs> are really talking about this michelle you you're thinking of your assignments differently and 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 the scaffolding will be different so i'm, I'm glad you're getting a lot of use out of this I, I want to, I'll just echo what, what Eric already said about the sort of the non-zero grading value. Um, the, 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 there's, a, there's a real big, a huge jump between something worth 0% and something worth 1% and not necessarily a whole lot beyond that. I mean, maybe there's, there's a level where it's like final exam or something and they're super stressed because it's worth 20% of their grade, but really you've got a hundred percent course grading schema to, to sort of spread about however you want. And you can almost cut that into as many pieces as you want. And students will do the things that are worth points and really not do the things that aren't worth points. So it, it is it is a put your points where your mouth is kind of situation, but that's the great thing about percentages. Like you can you can cut it up kind of however you like um, and, and incentivize it in a meaningful way for students. I see a, um, a question in there about have we received feedback on this? And yes, tons. Um, I've been, I've been using the system for about six years, um, tons of student feedback on it, um, almost entirely positive. Um, maybe a handful of students have complained about too much structure, but I mean, but it's, it's uh, like, uh, these are large enrollment courses, a handful of students out of, you know, I'm probably going on tens of thousands of students now. Um, so yeah, it's, it is well received. And then we also just did a big research project, just uh, looking at, um, at online courses in our college uh, recently. And, um, and the research, the, the results back from that were, you know, students were really positive about these heavily structured courses that have a lot of organization to them, um, that have some really good repetition to them, transparent structure. Uh, so it was, it was um, incredibly good feedback on it. Still have a little bit of time left. So any more questions or anything you want? guys to elaborate on? Um, I guess I can answer the same question to fill the void. Uh, so I don't, I don't have I don't have the the same uh, pedigree that that Eric has with with his BA 240 class. But um, I, I think students are receptive when you point out that they are not sitting in a classroom, right? They they were going to be sitting there for three or four hours a week in a classroom and and doing eye clicker or other sort of student engagement kind of questions during that time. You have just replaced this with whenever they feel like doing this now that can up in whatever kind of bite-sized chunks they like. So um, there is, there is a, you know, there's an appeal and the flexibility to it. So I think students have responded to that. Um, and then when they really, when, when anybody has really questioned like, oh, this feels like a lot of stuff, then I just remind them about that time discrepancy, right? They're, where, they're, where they're not sitting in a classroom anymore. And, and so do you really feel like you're spending more than three or four hours a week working on videos and, and virtually none of them have said that they are. Uh, so I, I think as long as we can draw those kind of modality contrasts where they, they remember what it, what it was like back in the day when we used to sit in classrooms, um, then there, there, it, it isn't as uh, foreign to them, I guess, or it doesn't feel like as, as big. So Lori mentions Blackboard's ability to track students' time spent on each question. Does Canvas have this capability? So Karen, Canvas, that's probably a good question for you. Canvas does have this capability, and but it's kind of in a, in a different spot than you might anticipate. For Canvas, we would go into the settings and a feature option called the quiz log audit. So in Canvas, if we go to our feature options and turn on that quiz log audit, we can see how long students spend on each question. We can see if they left the exam, i.e. left that window. If they pull up their smartphone, we're not gonna see that. But if they leave the window, go to another tab, go someplace else, Canvas will tell us if they've left the exam, but it will and it will tell us how long they've spent on each question. And that can be super important sometimes. So I always encourage faculty to turn on that feature option. And we do wish it was on by default and I'm not sure if Blackboard's is, but totally agree with you, Lori, thank you.
So also, um, you just mentioned a cell phone. Does the strategy work well on multiple devices? So part of that is going to depend if you're on your cell phone with Canvas, then you need to make sure that you have the latest operating system installed and that you're using the Canvas app and that you have the latest app installed. But the cell phone does work well as long as everything is up to date. Now, Eric and Mike might talk to if they've had any students complaining of problems, but in terms of supporting Canvas and that side, as long as everything is up to date with that cell phone in terms of the app for Canvas and the app for the cell phone itself, it should work fine. I have a hard time with a small screen personally, but I know students do much better. And that'll obviously depend on the LMS too. So Canvas has an app. I'm sure some of the other, the big ones do, Blackboard, D2L, things like that. Um, maybe if some of the smaller ones, um, I don't know about that, but um, I think we have time for just this last question. Um, we've got a four minutes left. Can you see video stats in Panopto as well? And yes, you can. So. Um, and I'm sure other things like Kaltura and you know if you if you have other video systems, but they allow you to see the stats on the video, even if these videos are embedded in your um, in your Canvas or whatever your quizzes, you could still see the individual statistics on the video. So you can see if the students are watching those again after you know they've completed it. So yeah, you you do have more information. Yeah, and on the on the question of mobile devices, uh, sure. I mean, so long as it's content that makes sense for a mobile device. I think it works well. The, the, the quiz structure works well. Students do plenty of the BA 101 course on their phones because they're watching videos and then answering multiple choice questions. And so that, um, that works out just fine. Obviously, for the spreadsheet analysis course, that wouldn't make nearly as much sense, but it's amazing what students do on mobile. And, and certainly, yeah, that, that this system does work on mobile. Right. I, I do think that's important. Um, I, I've had students come up to me to ask questions in, in web work. I don't know if anybody's used that system for, for math in particular, but you're doing math homework on your cracked screen phone and you're saying, hey, can I have help with this question? And I'm like, I can't even read what, what I, uh, how are you working on that? But they're trying. So yes, we need to make sure that these are all mobile, <laughs> mobile compatible too. All right, I think we'll turn this back over to our moderator. He's got a survey for you guys. And thank you for joining us today. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Thank this, you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody here. And thank, thank you to the presenters. That was, that was really great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend my faculty watch the video. Actually, it looks like we had, a, had at least one person from CBC here. But uh, I recommend that. So yeah. So. I think uh, this is the last session for the day. Uh, the variety show, nobody signed up for to, to provide variety. So it's going to be a game gaming show instead. There'll be some particip participatory games you can participate in. That's the way it is when it's participatory is you participate in them. It's a long day. Anyway, thanks and hope we'll see you all tomorrow. I um, don't think there's anything else I'm supposed to do. Oh, I guess gonna turn off the recording. I'll turn off the recording. Okay. Well, bye, guys. That was super fun. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks.